Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is James Harding. Uh, I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And this evening, we're holding a thinking, one of our open editorial meetings, on what, what, what might well be the most significant question in the history of the United Kingdom in my lifetime, which is whether or not Nicola Sturgeon will lead Scotland to independence. And if that sounds a little grand, given everything else that's going on in the world, a COVID pandemic, a coming recession, a US presidential election, the nature of Tortoise is that we're a newsroom type trying to understand the news stories that don't just happen, not just those blockbuster events, but those seismic developments, the ones that creep up on you. And in the course of 2020, one of the very fundamental things that has crept up on us, and I say this as a Londoner who's watched from afar, is a very different experience of the pandemic and the government's handling of the pandemic as it's perceived uh, north and south of the border. And what we hope to learn this evening with an extraordinary uh, group of people uh, directly involved or directly commentating or directly observing uh, what's happening in Scotland is the, the politics and the process um, that's at play there. But I just want to reiterate the nature of a thinking is it's an open news meeting. We want to hear from everyone. We want to learn from your point of view, your personal experience or expertise on the subject. Don't hold back. You'll see that my colleague Barney McIntyre is here marshalling the chat. There he is, hello Barney. Already um, uh, I see people weighing in. Please don't hold back. As you do in the chat, I'll bring you into the conversation. Um, you'll know though your way around Zoom by now. If you press the participants tab, you can raise your digital hand. I'll make sure to bring you in on that too. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, say rather boastfully that we can't quite believe our luck in the gang of people that uh, we brought together. My colleague Mark and Andrew has invited a great group of people together. Um, Sir John Curtis, um, uh, John, this is uh, uh, th this is easy. This is just a fact. Uh, uh, Britain's uh, most respected pollster. Um, we have Linda Fabiani, who's an MSP um, for East Kilbride, but uh, also has the rather uh, grand and wonderful title of the Deputy Presiding Officer of the Scottish Parliament. Stephen Gethins, many people will know, is a former M uh, uh, MP, uh, SNP MP, so we'll know a little bit about the relationship, I hope, not just inside Scotland and its politics, uh, but into Westminster as well. And most importantly, we have you. Everyone who's joined us this evening, uh, uh, please weigh in. Um, I, I reserve one final introduction for my former colleague from the FT, uh, John Lloyd. Um, my very first job on a newspaper uh, was sitting getting John's uh, copy come in uh, from Moscow when he was the FT's Russia correspondent. So I'm particularly delighted and grateful uh, to John. And I should say it was probably his idea that we started thinking about this more deeply because it feels as though in the hurry of news, we're not really understanding quite what's at play in the UK. And John uh, and I talked earlier in the summer about giving this some more considered thought. There go the introductions. I'm going to turn first, if I might, to you, John Curtis. John, um, I, I was with you in the BBC studios in Glasgow the night of the referendum uh, in 2015. What's changed to, since then? What would happen in an independence referendum now? Well, if you take uh, the current opinion polls, we've had nine opinion polls uh, since June. Uh, these have all put uh, yes ahead and on average put yes at 54 and no at 46. That includes two polls that have come out very recently, uh, one by comrades over the weekend that put it at 53 and one today uh, that's may, making a lot of headlines from Ipsos Mori that puts it at 58, which is a record high. But I think at the moment one has to say it's too early to say that support's necessarily gone up from being where we were. So how have we got from the 54% that we are now registering in the polls, and we have to bear in mind the fallibility of polls, but how do, we get, how do we get to there from, as you said, James, the 45% of, October, of September 2014. Well, um, to cut a potentially long story short, there are really two things that have gone on. The first is Brexit. One of the ironies of the 2014 independence referendum is that politicians on both sides of the argument spend endless hours arguing about whether or not an independent Scotland would or would not be able to be a continuing member of the European Union. 
it was all a waste of time. There was no relationship at all between people's views on the European Union and whether or not they voted yes or no. However, after the 2016 EU referendum, that link did begin to appear. Some people who voted uh, uh, yes, but then leave, and there were around one in three of yes voters, switched to no. They thought the UK finally was having sense because it was going to leave the European Union. But conversely, yes, there were some people who had voted no and remain who switched in favor of yes. However, for quite some considerable time, the net effect of all of this was zero. We were still at yes 45, no 55 in aggregate, but the character of support for yes, and indeed the character of support for the SNP was being changed by Brexit. We then got to last year, when consistently the polls began to say, uh -uh, it's no longer 45, 55, it is 49, 51. That was the average across 13 polls last year. And the crucial pattern that underlay that was that all of the increase in support occurred amongst those who voted remain. And I think the truth is, whatever your preferences and views about either Brexit or the union, you cannot avoid what seems to be a fact, which is that the pursuit of Brexit is a crucial uh, factor that has indeed uh, undermined support for the union north of the border. But then we come to this year. Here the story seems to be a different one yet again. By the time we got to Brexit Day, we were basically at yes 50, no, uh, no 50. But as I already said, it's now higher. The increase this year has occurred amongst both Remain and amongst Leave voters, so therefore it's not Brexit what's doing it. What seems to be doing it are the very, very different perceptions uh, uh, north of the border of how well Nicola Sturgeon is thought to have handled the coronavirus as compared with Boris Johnson. They are miles apart in, uh, in perceptions, even though one might want to argue that the objective record is not that different. And we can get into conversations to why that is the case you may wish. But the crucial thing about this is that whereas Brexit, therefore, gave fuel to the narrative of the, of the yes side, which is that for so long as it's part of the UK, Scotland is at risk of having its democratic, which is unquote, overturned by the different views of, Eng uh, views of voters in England. What's happened in the last six months in the minds of voters is another narrative, uh, uh, nationalist narrative has had uh, evidence added to it, which is that has always been that an independent Scotland would govern itself more effectively than it is governed as part of the, of the uh, UK. And crucially, um, polling from YouGov really drives this home. Amongst those people who voted yes in 2014, only 4% think that Scotland would have handled the coronavirus worse if it were independent. However, 20% of no voters think that Scotland would have handled coronavirus better if it had been independent. And of course, in the 21 years of devolution, no more public policy has mattered more than coronavirus. Forget free tuition, forget uh, free personal care. Coronavirus is the most important public policy challenge facing devolution. Devolution has become visible. It has mattered, it's affected everybody's lives. And the judgment of the Scottish electorate is that devolution and the Scottish government has done well and the UK government has done badly. And that seems to be feeding into people's views now about how Scotland should be governed in future. And John, who are those yes voters now? That, if those polls are to be believed between 53 and 58%, who are they? Well, they are disproportionately younger people. Uh, so for example, if you take today's Ipsos Mori poll, amongst those people who are aged 16 to 24, most of whom who would not have been able to vote back in 2014, uh, it's 70-80% of them are in favour of uh, independence. And basically now, certainly you've got to get to, what well, I put it, quite considerably below, not that considerably below my age, before you get a majority in favour of staying in the union. So problem number one, you know, for uh, the union is that basically demographic turnover is slowly turning Scotland more pro, yes. The, uh, but that was something that was in evidence in 2014. Um, but in 2014, the very youngest age group didn't seem to be 
as enthusiastic about independence as those in their 30s or 40s, but now they do seem to be. The other feature of 2014 that was very marked was that uh, uh, female voters, women were much less likely to vote yes than were men. According to the recent polling, that's disappeared. The gender gap is gone. Now, you know, I guess, you know, you might want to believe it's because Nicola Sturgeon is now leading the campaign more than Alex Salmon. And maybe there is, maybe there isn't something to that. Um, but certainly, you know, that's what's going on. It's also, by the way, and this again is, you know, a white Keir Starmer's difficult, difficult position. It's around a third to two fifths of those people who voted Labour in December 2019. Uh, they're in favour of independence. And of course, as I've implied with my earlier remarks, I mean, amongst those people who voted Remain, uh, yes has been ahead actually now really for 18 months or so. So it's basically, it's Remain voters, it's now men and women, it is younger voters. Um, and is pretty much not, it's not just, as it were, the faith of the SNP. It's also, it's certainly a significant element of the Labour vote. Uh, and can you just pick up on that, just that last point, John? Labour yes voters, is yes. it clear who and where they are? Well, I mean, there aren't that many Labour voters in general in James now. I mean, putting a point, point. to remember, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, they're scattered in the in those, there'll be still a disproportion in those places where Labour is still relatively strong, which of course is, you know, various constituencies in the west of Scotland and in Fife primarily. So that's where they will primarily be. Um, but I, mean, I don't think we know much more than that about that. The only other thing we do know, and again, to sh show the importance of this is that, voters are much more likely to switch between Labour and the SNP, which is partly what this reflection, than they are between the Conservatives and the SNP. So, what, so one of the paradoxes of the current political situation in Scotland is that if Boris Johnson is going to succeed in denying the SNP a majority next year, which frankly I think they have to do if they're going to avoid the referendum, they need the Labour Party to recover north of the border. The Labour Party has an ability to win votes from the SNP, in a way that the Conservative Party is always going to struggle to do. You have to understand now that the Conservative Party north of the border is basically a niche movement. It's a niche movement of Leave voters in Scotland who, of course, are not very numerous. It's, it's the character of the Conservative Party across the whole of the UK. So there's a limit to the ability of the Conservative Party to expand much above 20, 21%, 22% of the vote. They need the Labour Party to do well. But somehow or not, I don't think you'll ever get anybody in Downing Street to admit it. And John, on that front, and I'm sorry, Neil Patel pointed out that I, when I introduced I was remembering we did so many votes in those days that I had, was talking about 2014, uh, and I mentioned 2015 instead. 2014, one of the other things that was different, of course, was the, at, was the attitude across the UK to Scottish, the idea of Scottish independence. And I just wondered how good the polling is in trying to track changing attitudes across the other three nations of the UK and specifically England? Yeah, there is some, there's not a lot. British Social Attitudes has been tracking uh, uh, some good over time. I mean, I think the honest truth is it's not clear that attitudes have changed that much in the rest of the UK uh, and that indeed, you know, most people inside uh, uh, England would prefer Scotland to remain part of the union. That, that doesn't come as a surprise. You know, you tend to get around 20, 25% support for independence. That said, I mean, we do have some polling out there that uh, amongst Leave voters at the end of the day, faced with a choice between getting out of the European Union and losing Scotland, getting out of the European Union is for them the more important objective. Um, and of course, you know, it is a, a great, great irony that, you know, at the moment, you know, a UK government which is desperate to get out of one single market is desperate to preserve another single market and quite why one is more important than the other, which, well, shall we say, is an interesting question for conversation. Well, John, on that note, um, why don't if I, if I might go to, go to Linda, because I suppose, you know, we're not as close to it as you are, trying to understand exactly what the SNP strategy is, particularly, Linda, when you've, when you've got the numbers that, that John's talking about, and you've got the election coming up next year, will, will you talk us through where, what the current SNP position is on getting to the next independence referendum, um, and, and how you think that politics in Scotland and the politics of the coronavirus impacts that? Hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think it's quite clear, um, you know, what our, our strategy is. 
which is to you know to to have a referendum when the majority of people want that referendum and are therefore entitled to it. And uh, you know I, I'm really delighted at the the steadiness of the opinion polls that are showing us we're on that way. Uh, you know it was interesting um, in your introduction, uh, John, when you you talked about creeping up, and and I think that that's the way Scotland tends to have done things. Uh, over history, you know, an idea comes in and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it becomes that movement that becomes unstoppable of the people. And I, I believe that's what's happened with the independence movement, a steady growing in confidence and in recognition that, yes, this is in fact possible. So our strategy has been quite clear all along. Um, the goalpost shifted. Um, you know, John Curtis spoke about the Europe question not being huge at the time of the 214 referendum. But then when Scotland, right across the country, including all local authorities, voted to remain in Europe, and then the recognition that it didn't matter what we voted because we were getting taken out anyway, that was a turning point. And that <laughs> made people realize that we do not make our own decisions. And it caused a bit of resentment, uh, as to why we don't make our own decisions and why we're not listened to. So we felt the goalposts had shifted. So yes, there was an entitlement to a further referendum because there was a material change in circumstances. Mm. Of course, then COVID happened and we've spoken about that. And that's the most important thing just now. That, that's just not in doubt. We have to deal with that. Alongside that, we are progressing uh, our plans for a referendum on independence. So the opinion polls are where they are. If we get that majority at the next election, um, I, I think it's there's an unassailable right uh, for Scotland to go to the polls and in independence. I believe the people um, are seeing that and that will be backed. And the very idea in a democracy of the UK Prime Minister saying, no, I'm not allowing that, just will not wash with Scotland. So, I think so it will be an, an unassailable movement. So, so Linda, let's... Could, could we just sort of progress that? Mm -hmm. So we wake up on the morning of the 7th of May. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that the SNP has won a majority in the Scottish elections. Mm -hmm. I suppose, obviously, we can't predict we can't predict what the outcome of those elections are, but a lot would depend on what the scale of that majority was. But let's mm -hmm. assume it was a majority. What is the process that flows from there? Well, remember, to, we're not the only party that believes in independence mm -hmm. um, for Scotland. The Green Party have a representation too in our parliament and the, the polls are showing that they will increase that as well. So you will have a, a Scottish parliament with the majority of members who believe in independence. But you surely must also have members there, particularly in the Labour Party, I would suggest, who recognise that you must allow a referendum, even if they won't go that step towards saying Scotland should be independent, they cannot deny the democratic right of Scotland to have a referendum. Meanwhile, we are currently working on a referendum bill in this term of parliament that will be agreed by the Electoral Commission, the question and um, the method of it. We've already agreed the franchise for Scottish elections and uh, we will be putting it to the people that there should be another referendum. And the Scottish uh, Parliament, I, I think, will back that. And therefore, surely within any democratic settlement, the UK government cannot say, we will not allow you to have that. And, and Linda, there are two things that, that get talked about here. And as you can hear, I'm in London, so I'm closer yeah. to the politics in Westminster than I am to the politics in Holyrood. But one question is this. Would the SNP be willing to go ahead with a referendum when some of the terms of the outcome are, are, are pre-agreed in a way that they weren't in 2014? So, for example, currency, uh, energy reserves, status of, on national security issues. The, do you think the SNP would be willing to do what some people in London you hear talking about, even in quite senior conservative circles, say they are willing to consider, which would be a referendum, but you know, only in the instance that those really significant things are already agreed so that a campaign could be conducted on the substance of what a different Scotland, an independent Scotland would look like. 
Well, that's for the SNP to decide. That 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 would be policy of how the party goes forward. I can't just make that decision, um, you know, on behalf of my party. We have democratic processes that you would have to go through. There would also be discussions uh, with the other parties who believe in independence um, and those who think we should have a referendum. So that would be for discussion. Okay, and then the second question is the Plan B question, the sort of, if you like, the Catalonia example. In the event that London blocks a Scot Scotland from having an independent referendum, what's the, I, I'm not asking you to then make up SNP policy on the hoof either here, but what's the mood in the party? There is, or, There must be some that say, come on, let's get on with it, and some that say, actually, th there's no point pressing ahead unless we have a legitimacy around a referendum. Can you take, sort of give us a flavour a little bit of inside the S SNP and on, on that? Well, that's an ongoing discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a very vibrant, as I say, democratic party. So yes, uh, we have discussions about these things all the time, but our policy making fora are where we decide these things. We have our conference coming up in November, for example, and I'm pretty sure that'll be one of the questions that dis that's discussed. Uh, but nobody's going to uh, have a plan B, plan C or plan D right. and put it out there. Right. Uh, because the first plan is the one that's democratically correct. The first plan is the one that Scotland has a right to. And that's oh. what we're concentrating on. Um, and thank you. I'm going to, you, by the way, as we're speaking, there's just a waterfall of comments in the chat and I want to bring in some <laughs> of those people. But I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go to John Lloyd. John, I'm going to ask you to do two things if you can interpret a little bit of the politics in Westminster for us, as well as the politics in Holyrood. What, what do you think is happening, given the picture that John Curtis painted right at the start? Well, John, you're muted, forgive me. Hang on, are we hearing you? There you we can, go. Yeah, we can hear you now, yeah, sorry. I think a number of things are happening. One, I think, is that that the, and I'm no Westminster correspondent, but it's fairly obvious that there is within the Conservative Party and probably within the other parties as well, a split on this. I've, I've heard Conservatives say that were the SNP to win the huge victory, it hopes it will, and that many people think it will do in May next year and, and commands possibly with the Green Party, the majority of the seats in, the, in Holyrood, it will then, uh, have a right to have a referendum. Some people, I think, uh, though not very vocal at the moment within the Conservative Party, say, well, let them have it, and if they go, they go. Um, that surely is not the position of the Cabinet, and certainly not of Boris Johnson. No Prime Minister wants to be the one to lose uh, Scotland, because what it would mean, and one has to remind oneself, as you did earlier, of the stakes in this, if Scotland becomes independent, it isn't, doesn't just leave and leave, of course, the large majority of the British in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, where it was, where they were. It will end the United Kingdom. The United is the union between Scotland and England, uh, made in 1707, therefore more than 300 years old. And that will be a huge event. It will hugely damage the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I would argue, too, that it would hugely damage Scotland, but that we may get back to that. So there is, I think, there is still, probably in the cabinet, but certainly also in the party, a number of people who say, if the SNP are that strong, the only way to stop them is by using the prime minister's veto. And that is a reserved power. Uh, so one could argue democracy two ways, the, the, um, the position of Scotland and the position of England have been to have reserved powers for Westminster, that is the reserved power, it's perfectly democratic for the Prime Minister to say, no, you can't go, you had it uh, in 2014, it was then said by the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, that there wouldn't be another one for a generation, so uh, let it go. You can't have it for the moment, and they're in the hope that the enthusiasm will die down and possibly even that the Labour Party will get off its back and begin to be a, a proper party again and win back, win back some votes. So uh, divided, uh, I would bet, if anything, that come a smashing SNP victory, 
that the Prime Minister would still say no. John, that's, that's really interesting. I, I'm going to come, as you were talking, um, actually Chris Anderson I saw in the chat made this point that said Boris Johnson with an 80 seat majority in Westminster is going to just stick to that position that it, that, that is a no. Yeah. Um, th this may feel like it's a slightly hot-headed question, so I may be wrong about this, but is there not a risk in that, in a Scottish election that sees a strong SNP win a what must look like a mandate for a second referendum, mm -hmm. and then a prime minister in Downing Street saying no, you know, especially one who's got into uh, office on a take back control, you know, assertion of democratic democratic rights mandate. How how, how does he make the, the the moral argument for that? Well, the moral argument I think is this that that. I hate to correct John Surt John Curtis, but when Curtis uh, rather, but when when he said that that single market, uh, United Kingdom single market, European Union, it's not quite right. There is a single market uh, in the European Union, and I, I think it was a mistake to leave it. Uh, but the UK is different. It has it's a fiscal union. And that fiscal union has got stronger, especially in the 20th and 21st and 20th century. And the fiscal union means that all parts, all nations, all five nations, England by huge amount, the, the biggest, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, are part of a fiscal union in which public spending is evened out among the, the four nations. And Scotland has done and continues to do very well out of that. It's got uh, a subsidy of between 10 and 12 billion pounds a year. And for a relatively small economy, that's, that's quite a lot. A fiscal union is also a moral union. It's a moral union in which people more or less passively agree that that is the way that we British should live. Uh, we equal, equalize out the, the, the taxation, the public spending, uh, and those which have more, which tends to be the Southeast of England and London um, give to the, those which have less. So uh, uh, to, to leave that union is not just to go into another union, which would be uh, take at least five years. There's some analysis by LSE, which says it would take five years at least right. through the negotiations for Scotland to become part of the, uh, of the European Union. So to leave a fiscal union in which you benefit enormously with, with five years of being in the kind of wilderness of negotiations, and negotiations will be at least as tough, probably tougher than the Brexit ones, uh, and then face uh, an uncertain future when unemployment will be huge after the, after the end of COVID, assuming COVID does end at some point, is for uh, the SNP to do that, uh, to win an independence referendum and go for independence would be hugely irresponsible, most of all, to the people they claim to represent, which are the Scottish people. John, th thank you. You, uh, you'll also uh, see. There's a lot of my God. It's such an amazing, interesting subject. There's a lot of commentary on your commentary, so I'm going to uh, come back to you in a moment. I'm I'm going to bring a, a bunch of people. Um, I want to come in a moment to Akash Porn and to Gail Addis and Chris Anderson, a group of others. But before I do that, I'm going to have allow myself a little bit of fun, which is to ask Stephen Gethins, who's been in Westminster and seen the runaround um, within Westminster politics as regards uh, Scotland and independence, to try and read the rooms for us on this critical question of whether there's any or any circumstances in which he sees a Boris Johnson-led government allowing for a referendum, because to an extent, the answer to that question answers our question of the night, whether Nicola Sturgeon will lead Scotland to independence. Well, you know, James, I think it's a matter of one thing in politics, you always remember, is what's said before an election and what's said after ele an election or a referendum for that matter, are often two very different things. Now, the Conservatives in Scotland are saying no way to an independence referendum. Um, I'm not sure that can hold. I think Linda was right when, when she said, if you have yet another mandate, um, for independence. And let's not forget, in 2016, the Scottish government was elected um, with its manifesto that said, um, and remember this was six weeks before the EU referendum, it said, well, we should have another independence referendum if 
It's a material change of circumstances, such as Scotland being taken out of the European Union against its will. And interestingly, and John talked about Alex's once in a generation comment, but of course, Alex's once in a generation comment, if you if you read out the full quote, is of course, unless it's changed by a political event, and political events are when parties put things into manifestos and you stand on those manifestos. So I think it becomes very difficult. As you see with the Conservatives at the moment, who are very unpopular, I think Brexit's an enormous change. And actually, one thing that used to frustrate me at Westminster um, was the way, and I'm sure this will be something that's been a frustration of John's as well, who's somebody who's, 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 who's proudly pro-union and rightly so. Um, we may disagree, but, but I often find there were too few unionists in the sense that people didn't understand the multinational, um, that the, the, the UK is a multinational state. It is not a, a unilateralist state. And also the way that people would equate the United Kingdom with the European Union. You know, why on earth would you want to join the EU and not be a member of the UK? Fails to understand both, both organisations, if you like, and the place that sovereignty sits. And of course, the ideas of sovereignty are different in Scotland and in, in England. And I would refer anybody to the Lord Cooper judgment way back in the 1950s, which is still a fascinating read. So it was a huge frustration in Westminster about that failure to understand the nature of the UK. And that really came um, into focus with the vote in terms of um, taking the UK out of the European Union. Because of course that, that was very important. We saw that not just in Scotland, but the way it had an impact in Northern Ireland as well. And taking your EU citizenship off of people, which is what you're doing, has a direct impact. And I think that's why you're seeing such high numbers mm -hmm. of younger people. And when I say younger people, under 45s in very significant numbers, and I squeeze in just into that age range, um, who, who, who are in favour of independence. Um, I, I'm going to come back to Stephen because I want to get a sense, if you can, of how you think 2021 yep. play, plays out. And I'm also struck by the fact that we always have this conversation about, if you like, hand-to-hand -hand combat in Westminster politics, but actually getting a vision of what the UK uh, in the next decade might look like um, is something you miss. So I'd like to come back and give ourselves a bit of time for that. But I'm really struck by a, a number of comments. Firstly, uh, I, I think it's clear you're hearing from people that they don't see Johnson making that decision in this next, in this coming parliament. Uh, Chris Anderson, you made that uh, point, and Akash Porn too. Chris uh, Anderson, sorry, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so your your your, your view is th th this question waits till the end of Boris Johnson's premiership. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the comments he's made to date on this have been very clear that you know whenever this question comes up, it's. The, you've had a referendum already in 2014. It was badged as a once in a generation vote, and therefore, you know, with, there's no reason to to have another to have another referendum. A generation hasn't passed, effectively. Right. Um, and so, and I don't think the SNP. I think the SNP has said on numerous occasions, you know, they don't want to do anything that is outside of the legal process. You know, if they want to go down the independence route, it has to be through the legal mechanism of getting in a referendum approved and, and going through that. So, effectively, if Boris doesn't approve that then that can't happen um i think you might see a shift in tone maybe uh, after may so i think boris might move from uh no to this isn't the right time and i think there's a lot of ways that he could do that like a you know a covid recession recovery or oh you know we, we need time to build back from what we have before we start thinking about these big questions or something so you might I, see that but i, I, I don't I'm think there'll be much else forgive me where where are you i'm edinburgh uh, so is there is there any version of rather than just a flat no but this isn't the right time that doesn't stoke support for independence um that's a good question i think potentially only if the, the no or this isn't the right time came with some additional devolution or or some some way to say that you're recognizing that the Scottish people want more power over their own future. You know that this the, the same mechanism has happened in the twenty four before the twenty fourteen referendum, where there was additional devolution that was put aside as a sort of we recognise the Scottish people want want extra say over their over their own destiny. Um, I, I'm going to ask Chris. That's really interesting. I'm going to ask Gail 
add this because Gail made the point that it's part of the politics of COVID-19 that we that everyone wants government close to home. I don't know, Gail, whether you're there. Yes, I'm here. Hello there. Hi. So, so, uh, and forgive me, where are you? I'm in Glasgow. Right. And so, so, so what's, what's your read on what's happening, what the impact of 2020 will be on this argument? Well, my feeling is that uh, people are looking for a magic solution to what's happening to us all with COVID. Um, and I, I also see that what's happening throughout the UK, and I think that was my point that you maybe picked up in the chat, is that uh, people are re rebelling against uh, what Boris Johnson is doing and what the central government is doing. I think this might be a flag up for a, an epoch where we have perhaps more um, local uh, authority, you know, more mayors. Um, Alec Massey was making the point that we don't have, uh, last weekend, that we don't have any significant mayors um, look at speaking for our cities in, in Scotland and we maybe need to, to do that. The problem with the whole of the UK is that it's power centralised in London and in, and in Scotland it's also centralised in Edinburgh and as we see uh, from the recent uh, um, votes in Orkney and Shetland uh, um, they might look for a, a Crown Protectorate Authority, you know, a situation if Scotland did go independent. So I think there's a, 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 a movement that you're beginning to see for more um, local democracy throughout the UK, not just here in Scotland, not just in Wales. Uh, and and sorry, I don't know whether I'm allowed to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you any, anyway, if I may, Gail. 2014, mm -hmm. how did you vote? Um, I voted uh, to remain in the UK and I, I voted to remain in the EU too. I don't see anything other than disruption and destruction of leaving either union. That's and, and that hasn't, and, and then so how do you interpret what John Curtis said at the start in terms of the shift in, in, in polls? You, polls? Anecdotally, do you see a shift in sentiment amongst friends and people you know. Yes, I, I, I do I do see that, um, but I, I do feel a lot of it's to do with COVID. A lot of it's to do with the perception that Nicola Sturgeon is a much better uh, leader than Boris is. But the figures here in Scotland don't bear that out. 47% of our deaths uh, were in care homes. Uh, we're still we're we're way up in the league of, of deaths from COVID, uh, same, very similar to England and Wales. Uh, compared to the rest of Europe. So, th Gail, thank you very much. I just want to, I want to go back to John Curtis, if I might, for a minute, just because, John, we're, we're, we're in danger of kind of solidifying around a, uh, or, or sort of congregating around a settled view that Boris Johnson says, no, there's a, there's a head of steam around a referendum, but it doesn't get um, a legal uh, ratification or recognition in Westminster. I saw in the chat that you said actually there are challenges that the government in Scotland could put, which would in turn, which might eventually make their way to the Supreme Court. I don't exactly understand how that path works. Do you do you want to just talk us through it? Or, or John Curtis, if you just dropped that tidbit and then left us all to, to, to do the legal work for ourselves. OK, so the, the, the point I'm making, James, is that if you go back to the minority Scottish government of 2007 to 2011, which was able to spend a lot of time thinking about how you might hold an independence referendum without even having a majority at Holyrood to hold one, it came up with a formulation for holding a referendum on Scottish independence, which it, uh, simply using Holyrood's authority, which it argued would be legal. And essentially the, 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 the plan it came up with was a referendum question that ran roughly, do you agree that the Scottish government should enter into negotiations with the, with the UK government with a view to Scotland becoming an independent country? And the argument of the Scottish government was, is that because the Scottish government does have locus in intergovernmental relations, it is therefore uh, possible for it to hold a referendum on the basis of Hollywood's authority. Now, the honest truth is, if you got five or six public lawyers together, 
you would, uh, sorry, you get two or three public lawyers together, you would get five or six different opinions about whether or not this would get past the Supreme Court. But I, the point I'm simply making is that it's not 100% sure that Boris's no would stick. Although, of course, if Holyrood holds its own referendum, the UK government would not be under any obligation to recognize the result, but it would not necessarily, question mark, be illegal in the way that the referendum in Catalonia was. And in any case, certainly I think what one could anticipate, one could certainly anticipate that the SNP might well attempt to hold a referendum because, you know, uh, to be honest, they'd be quite delighted to see the sight of Boris Johnson being rescued by the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, they would uh, imagine that that might add uh, fuel to the flames of uh, support for independence. And John, that's so interesting and, and speaks to the tactics, I suppose, we should watch out for in the discussion about Plan B and the conversation I had with Linda. I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm aware that I've, I've seen that Brian Wilson is here. And as a um, uh, many people will uh, will know that Brian he was a Minister of State for Scotland. And I think I've trailed around after him uh, back in the day. Brian, are you there? Because I wonder whether or not you feel in all of this um, as uh, as someone from Labour, you look at all this and think, does the does the journalistic world give Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP too easy a ride? Is the is the argument around uh, independence uh, not properly interrogated? What do you make of it? Uh, well, I'm here incidentally because I was asked to be. But <laughs> yeah, well, that's very nice. Of, thank you. Nice to be that's here. Very good of you. Nice that's all be the better. Um, but the well, of course they do, and and I think the um, you know the London media has you know for, for decades has fallen into this trap that it, it gives a, a soft ride. I mean, it, it, it treats, you know, it's a bit of a paradox, you know, for, for someone who is, um, just doesn't want to break up Britain. But of course the London media, I mean, it, it almost treats Scotland like a, a foreign correspondent, you know, and it, it takes the tablets of stone that are handed, handed down, it accepts received wisdom. And so all this stuff, and the SNP are very expert at, at uh, manipulating that. So the messages are, are pervade to London of how well we're doing, for instance, on uh, COVID, which we certainly are not. Uh, and then these are conveyed back into Scotland as uh, as confirmation of what um, uh, you know of what they would like us to believe. And we also have the extraordinary situation in Scotland just now, where where Nicola Sturgeon gets essentially a daily party political broadcast endlessly. I mean, there is nothing to compare with it, not only in the UK but anywhere in. In, a, in, in, in Western Europe, or possibly even Eastern Europe. Um, but anyway, I mean, these are, these are passing points, you know, that they're, they're part of the debate. I mean, I, th I think the, the main discussion around this is that, uh, the, the point is that, that until now, um, certainly, that the, the case, the, the, the nationalists have always tried to rewrite, to falsify the narrative really, by saying mm -hmm. that Scotland was being denied something that it wanted. Mm -hmm. And all the evidence that's confirmed finally in 2014 uh, was that Scotland didn't want it. Yeah. Um, and if that changes, and I, I'm not by no means convinced it will change, but if that changes, then you're into a very different uh, narrative and one so, uh, that has to be to be reassessed. And, and Brian, look, I'm, I'm aware of what Gail was saying about the record on COVID and the interrogation of the record on COVID in Scotland. There's obviously a, a, a big political story inside the SNP between Salmon and Sturgeon. Mm. And I just wonder what your interpretation of that is in two ways, particularly Brian. One is actually what you think really happened, but specifically to what the impact you think that will, will, will have on the SNP. Well, the indications are it's not, not having a lot of, of impact because you know, very understandably, people are more concerned with a matter of life and death yeah. than they are with um, feuding politicians or, for, 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 for what, whatever reason. Um, you know, I think what is obviously true and is you now pretty universally accepted is that, uh, that Nicola Sturgeon has been a, you know, um, what's, what's a, guilty of some terminological inexactitudes. In fact, you know, she has constantly contradicted herself. And, but it's about, it's, it's such a complicated story that does anybody really care? I don't know. I certainly don't want Scotland's future to be determined on the basis of that kind of, you know, pretty sleazy uh, dispute within the, the SNP and the bloodletting that's gone on w w within it. I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, and go back to my previous point, that, that the case against independence has always rested on the fact that people didn't want it, and they didn't want it for very, very good reasons. 
And that argument still has to be won. Uh, and if you don't win, if you don't win that argument, um, then you know you're defending something. It is that much more difficult to defend. So the argument must be won. And then, and then Brian, can I ask you one other thing? If you were advising Keir Starmer and you're writing the, assuming it's the 2024 manifesto, right? And let's just scroll forward four years. There's there's not been an independence referendum, but the SNP is strong in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, what's the position that Labour should take? Well, the first thing, if I can just go back a wee bit to say the first thing I would advise Keir Starmer on now is to do something about the Scottish Labour Party because it is a disgrace and an embarrassment. Uh, it has got 13% in the polls, and that is a large part of the key uh, to why we're having this dis discussion tonight, 13% of in, in the polls. In the Highlands and Islands where I'm sitting at the European elections, you've got 4% of the vote. Now that is where, now we are in the, the Scottish Labour Party is still in the post-Corbyn age of utter dereliction. And unless that is sorted out, which I believe certainly needs a change in, in uh, leadership. I mean, the, the polls that John Scurswis was talking about today, 13% for Labour and fewer than half of the 13% of confidence in the leader. How on earth can you go into an election next May on that basis? But on your other question, I, I would review it. Uh, you know, the, the, the important thing is a, by, by ne in next May is to try to win this argument, win the argument in favor, not of unionism. I didn't come in to politics to be a unionist. I came in to advance the social and economic interests of working people and their families throughout the United Kingdom. And that is the argument that has to be made by labor. And on that basis, you can win. If you're divided into a battle of flags of union jacks and saltires, you lose. Right. So we, the, the narrative of Scottish politics has to be changed and it's Labour's dereliction of duty in allowing it to, to, be, to come to the point it's at just now, which is largely responsible for the situation we're in. Uh, Ron, thank you. I really appreciate it. I just, th there were a couple of other comments before I go back to, to, to Linda and Stephen and, uh, uh, and the two Johns. James Shepherd Barron, A, wrote a scathing note from north of Inverness and I said to him, can I come to you on this? And he said, yes, but I'm cooking haggis. So I partly want to see him doing that and, and <laughs> analyzing the Scottish <laughs> energy situation. So this Sorry, is- have to get it. It's like, some, it's like, some, it's like something you've been rehearsing, all, we've been rehearsing all afternoon. Let's discuss the Scottish situation while cooking haggis. Okay. Uh, I, here? I love, here's the haggis, where's the haggis? There's the haggis. <laughs> you can't see it. No, you can't, and I don't want you to tip it up. <laughs> no, uh, that would um, short circuit my laptop. Um, uh, James, fascinating to, to, to be on these things. I learned so much. I don't have much to, to add, except I'm a voice from the, from the Highlands and Islands, as your previous guest was. Um, what was my point? My point was that it's about the economic stupid. And I, I, I really do look out of my window, if it weren't already dark. And to the north, I see wind farms everywhere um, because of the quite right policy to have renewables and all the rest of it. And to the east, the world's biggest offshore wind farm is being put in. Um, the bits have, have been put together, the components have been put together in the NIG oil rig yards to my west. So on three sides, I'm, I'm daily confronted with policy in real time. My challenge to Nicola and to any politician in Westminster, but particularly in Holyrood, is why have my bills not gone down? Why have my landowning friends become rich uh, on having access roads driven into the countryside? And why are all the enormous bits of hardware being bolted together coming from the other side of the world when they could easily be built in an oil rig yard that has all the capacity here and yet all the talent has been laid off? And my, my, my supposition is that this has been done because people who do the math and who, who award contracts, they don't understand value, they just understand cost. And the cost utility of laying off the highlands for generations to save a few pennies while enriching a few, while my bills have gone up, not down, maybe they would have gone up further. I will vote for anybody that can answer the question. And Nicola, and it kind of sticks in my gullet a bit, and the SNP, if they can answer that question, and they do, they get my support. Thank, well, thank you, James. I, th thank you for, your, for that, and enjoy the haggis. 
I'm going to I'm going to wind up if I if I might by just going back. I want to go back first to to Stephen, right? Because I think the one thing we haven't done enough on here is the divisions within the SNP, and and whether or not that plays out. Stephen, you've got at least a little distance on it now. Um, I wouldn't say a great deal of distance, but a little distance on it. Does it, is that inevitable in any political party, or is this actually probably underestimated by those of us who don't understand the workings of this, and it's going to have an impact on how this plays out? I think, I mean, firstly, I'll, I'll, I'll say to James, here's me trying to bang stereotypes on the head, and there's him cooking haggis in the Highlands. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I'd very happily, we don't have enough time to tackle his questions on energy and that drive to 100% renewables, which was really important. On, on the divisions, I have to say, I was at Westminster and I can remember speaking to my colleagues about Brexit, about social policy, and there was real unity of, um, you know, there was real purpose and there was real unity in the group. Now, you didn't have to agree with the group, but I can remember the unity that we had in our group. And of course, in any political party, you'll get folk who fall out with each other and all the rest of it. But remember, when I was at Westminster, you had Jeremy Corbyn leading a pretty fractious Labour Party. You had Theresa May, leading a pretty fractious Conservative Party, and the Liberals who were really, really struggling to, to figure out what they were for. So I have to say I found it overplayed. And you get divisions in any party, but, you know, when I was at Westminster with that group with the 56 or the 35 members of Parliament, we did not have the divisions that others had. We did not have the rebellions that others had. And one thing you shouldn't underestimate about the SNP, and you can agree with them or you can't, is that unity of purpose around independence because they know where they want to get to. Mm -hmm. Under Jeremy Corbyn, you could not argue that the Labour Party knew where they wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. Under Boris Johnson, I'm not sure you can argue that the Conservative Party know where they want to get to. And that unity of purpose around independence is critical and it was very important to the cohesiveness and also that pro-Europeanism, which was reflected in the broader Scot Scottish electorate, was also reflected within the SNP group as well. So, Stephen, thank you. I'm, I'm going to just, uh, as we close, I want to just ask Linda and ideally Brian and John, if they might, just preview for us what the arguments in the 2020s will be, what the case, Linda, for an independent Scotland will be, and John, uh, John Lloyd and, uh, and Brian Wilson, if you would, what the case against will be. Linda, are you there? Uh, yeah, I am. Well, for me, it's very straightforward. It's the reason I joined the SNP decades ago, and it's what's informed my politics from day one. And it was interesting what Gail said, too, because it sort of ties into it. I, mean, I believe that decisions should be made as close to the people who are affected by them as possible. So I do actually... Um, believe in the devolution of powers to local areas and local people, not necessarily to paid politicians, but to people making their decisions. And it's very, very logical to me that a country, a nation like Scotland, should make its own decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been just proven over and over again by the fact that Scotland doesn't get the governments it votes for. And Brian Wilson said something about, you know, the myth um, that Scotland doesn't get what it wants. Scotland didn't get to remain uh, in European membership with its people as European citizens. That's what we wanted, we didn't get it. So for me, it's simple. We make our own decisions in the interests of our nation. Brian, so what what the argument, that, Linda, thank you. Brian, what will the argument against be? Oh, sorry, you're muted, Brian. One sec. Yeah. No, sorry. Millions of millions of people elsewhere in the UK voted against Brexit and didn't get what they wanted either. I voted against Brexit. I didn't get what I wanted. But you move, you move on just as we moved on from 2014. But you know, my argument, I'm a you know from where, where I stand politically, is that every advance uh, in my lifetime that has benefited working people and their families, whether it's in education, whether it's in housing, whether it's workers' rights, all of that has been achieved in a, a, across the United Kingdom by a united labour movement through labour governments. And if you throw that away and you substitute it with the politics of an identity rather than of class and of division, the natural divisions along social and economic lines within society, then what you get is what you have in Scotland just now, which is an endless debate about the, con the Constitution while everything else 
uh, is ignored and is, is, is secondary and is actually not run very well. So the argument is Scotland needs a Labour government and, a, and the Labour Party needs Scotland. So Labour, get your act together and the two will benefit in partnership. Ron, thank you. John Lloyd? Uh, I just want to go back to what I said before uh, and to emphasize this, and that is the irresponsibility of the SNP if it does win this election, because it will then uh, go into a world in which it's going to lose the subsidy from the Treasury, the oil price will remain low, a hard border may come, we have a budget deficit without the subsidy of 8 to 9 percent, by far the highest in Europe, they they would have no currency of their own, it would be in a terrible financial situation. The country as a whole, the UK as a whole, would be in a, a pretty bad situation. Scotland would be a great deal worse. There is, however, and I agree with Brian very much on this, there is a, possible, a plan put forward actually by a professor at Glasgow Business School, Ronald MacDonald, which essentially says that the UK should do what, um, what the Beveridge Report did after the war, and that is realise the scale not just of the of what happens when we come out of COVID and the, and the debt comes due, but also of the enormous changes that will happen in the labour market and society with the coming of artificial intelligence and so on. In other words, we need a national plan, and the national plan can only come from a country which a has its own currency, has a, uh, a well working central bank, uh, and uh, has the scale to face up to challenges which are huge. Mm-hmm. huge when they come out. Scotland uh, could not do it itself, not because it's, it's unable in time to be uh, an independent country. It could become an ind- independent country, but it would go through a terrible period, a really awful period, were it to go for, go for that now. Mm-hmm. John, thank you. John Curtis, what, one final question for you, which is essentially about political memory. We talked about the movement of public opinion in an incredibly short period of time, really, 2014 to 2020. Your two points at the start were Brexit and COVID changing perceptions. How long will those perceptions last? How how does political memory and polling work? Yeah, that's an important question. I think the answer to, of course, is that Brexit is going to be with us because it's already half happened and will finally happen at the end of December. It's a subject that still divides the United Kingdom pretty much down the middle. Um, And I think it's unlikely that those people who have shifted in favour of yes because of their concerns about Brexit are likely to change their minds on independence anytime soon. Coronavirus, of course, however, is much more to do with Um, the handling of an issue, and as I've been saying in the chat, primarily to do with the seemingly much more effective presentational skills that Nicola Sturgeon has uh, shown during the course of the last six months than uh, the Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson. Um, That, of course, is much more potentially short term, and who knows, by May of next year, maybe Scotland will have suffered an even worse pandemic than England and Wales and people lose their faith in the Scottish government. And I think certainly what one does have to acknowledge is that one of the, the, the fact that this most recent rise in support of voters from about 50% to 54 has occurred during a largely a political vacuum, i.e. everything's been dominated by coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And we've not really even begun to have the kind of debate you've start, tried to start towards the end of this, uh, this session. Mm. Um, and that at the end of the day, what the Scottish public will think about the merits of independence, when we actually get back to having a debate about it, well, who knows? All that one does know is that some of the facts, or some of the supposed facts at least, that were true in 2014 have moved on. So if mm. Scotland is going to rejoin the European Union, that has already been igno- uh, mentioned, then the question of what do we do to the border between Gretna and Berwick? That wasn't an issue in 2014. Mm -hmm. Conversely, and I think we are perhaps slightly on the opposite side here of John Lloyd. Yeah, sure, even Andrew Wilson, uh, uh, the person who's come up with the SNP's economic plan uh, for independence acknowledges that in the short run, Scotland would find find itself in a fiscally challenging position. 
But arguably, given the, one of the things we've learned at the moment is that the judgment of market seems to be whatever the size of the deficit that a country is running, it's better to finance it than is to pull the plug, because if we pull the plug, things will be even worse. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, at least, given the size of the deficit that the United Kingdom is going to have, actually, whether or not the question of the fiscal deficit will be as pressing as it was six years ago is perhaps debatable. Now, the point is, things have changed, things have moved on, some pretty significant things have moved on. We've not really talked about them and debated them. And therefore, where we might end up at the end of a referendum campaign, yeah. frankly, who knows? John, John, thank you. I am really struck by that, by the fact that listening to, you know, Linda and Stephen and, and John and Brian, there is this debate about perceptions of power versus perceptions of prosperity. And we are having this conversation at such a precarious time, not least heading into what looks like as difficult a recession as any of us can remember. Um, we're going to end um, not by trying to um, uh, uh, take sides or, or draw straws, but actually just a small poll of our own. Uh, my colleague Sam Hockley just wanted to ask us a simple question. Having listened to all we've listened to, whether or not we think there is going to be, whether, whether people think Scotland will vote for independence in the 2020s. <laughs> well, um, I don't know, uh, as you can see, the polls, the, it's not exactly a representative sample, John, and you'll probably uh, shoot me for the amateurism of this, but the, the answer is at least the expectation, having listened to what we've heard, is that nearly 80% think that in the coming decade, Scotland will vote for independence. Um, uh, it, it's interesting just to uh, just to consider that. Um, I'm not sure people would have asked that. Oh, we should have asked people before the conversation too. That's true, at least that would have been more telling. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Can I say a really big thank you to, to John Curtis, John Lloyd, to uh, Linda Fabiani, to Stephen Gethins and Brian Wilson. Uh, really informative and valuable conversation. It's one I suspect we're gonna to want to have uh, again and more often. My apologies for running over on time, but I think you can understand why. Particularly interesting evening. Uh, many thanks and have a good evening all.